So today I'm going to be talking about reviewing AngularJS applications. So who am I? This is definitely not me. Um, so I am Lewis. I'm a security consultant at Sigital. I've been there for about a year and I've been doing a lot of web security. I'm also doing a PhD at Leeds Beckett, which is a better university than this. Sorry, Sheffield. Um, I'm a very simple man, and I have simple needs, and all I like is web security. That's pretty much all I do. And I try to go to the gym, but that never really works out. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Lewis Arden. So, oh, it's meant to be red, but anyway. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about what is AngularJS, give an overview of the framework, why should we as people who want to look at the security aspects of it care, um, and also how to assess it from looking at security caveats from the framework to what developers would introduce, where to look in the code because obviously that's always a good, part, good, start to place, uh, good place to start, and some tools that might be quite useful to use. So, what is AngularJS? AngularJS is an open source uh, MVC platform created by Google. It's a front-end MVC, so it's not your typical, um, you have um, your server and uh, your MVC is basically the view is the only thing that's meant to be on the client. It, everything is on the client. It has built-in data binding, so it has two-way and one-way data binding. This screen changed and this one didn't, so that was weird. Yeah, and it also has client-side templates. You can use pretty much any backend with Angular. It doesn't really matter. It can be Java, .NET, Ruby, you know, PHP, whatever. All works. Generally, people use it for single-page applications. So it has like in uh, deep uh, JavaScript links where you can click to stay on the same page. And it's more of a fluid experience. And AngularJS is supposed to simplify development and testing because it's very easy to mock things up. So this is the kind of what you would generally see. You have your MVC on the client, then basically gets wrapped up in JSON and then gets sent to the server. And a very basic intro to AngularJS, which doesn't look exactly what it looks like here. But So you have your ng app, which is basically you are telling your application you're going to bootstrap Angular. This is basically on a divider, so anything with inside that divider is now bootstrapped with Angular, as long as the JavaScript is obviously included on the page as well. Um, we have something called, oh, ng app. We also have the ng model directive, and this tells um, the view that you're going to be doing two-way data binding. And we have things called expressions. So I'll go a bit more into what the sandbox is in Angular later, but essentially an expression is a small um, JavaScript-like um, kind of takeaway because they've, they've basically moved away from the DOM. They don't like the DOM. They think it's a horrible mess. So they've basically moved that functionality away. So AngularJS as a whole, it has, it's kind of clusters and um, containers and, se and it separates your application. It doesn't really have a concept of a main method. So generally, you start off, you initialize a module, you give it a name, and then you start adding attributes to it. And this is what it kind of looks like. So within Angular, you have your module, and you have to basically initialize it with a name. Could be blank if you wanted to. But, and then you also have to include any dependencies that you want to use within your application. So for example, if I want to do routing inside my application, I have to include the ng route or root directive or module. And then I can call the function route provider, which is accessible from ng route. Like um, routing, so it also has the route provider where you can do, like for example, dot when. When you first browse to a website, you can choose a template URL, so what you want to display with inside the application, and also what kind of controller you need to do. So then we have controllers, and again, you have to do a module app, but then you can also include a controller, give it a name, obviously, and then you have things called scopes. And scopes are essentially objects that we use to reference into the view. So, for example, this could be like a tech piece of text, some array, an object. This is all basically, once you define it in a scope object, you can then reference it with inside an expression on the view. So as you can see, I've got a wonderful Hello SteelCon demo. So we've got a scope called Hello, and it, the text is called Hello SteelCon. This is 
not your average HTML. This has nothing really to do with Angular. It's just what I prefer. So this is a J template, and it's like a server-side template. And uh, you essentially can define small bits of HTML. You essentially bind your application with ng app. Um, this all should actually should also contain the controller, but it doesn't. Oops. And then you can also, on your paragraph tag, just include that. And if the if the controller was attached, you would have you know hello, you'd have hello uh, steelcon displayed on your view. There's also things called um, directives. So as I, and as I said before, um, you know Angular's moved away from the DOM. You can't access things. So essentially. Um, they have these directives, which are basically markers of the DOM. It talks to a HTML compiler, and then it basically transforms the DOM elements, and so on and so forth. So, for example, a directive called ng-click is basically a JavaScript on-click event. You also have services, and I'm probably going to go through this quite quickly because I've already used up quite a lot of time just going through the basics. But then you have services, which are basically used to um, share code within your organization or through your application. Um, AngularJS has inbuilt services, for example, $HTTP that you can use to send data to the server. Generally uses XML HTTP or just g generic JSON. You can also create your own services. So, for example, if you wanted to do a login request, you would build a login service that would do all the HTTP calls and so on and so forth. So, summing up, um, there's a philosophy in Angular, basically. There's a guy called Igor Mina from the Google team, and he essentially defines um, AngularJS as a model view whatever. They don't really care that you're using a controller. As long as you're building kick-ass applications, you can use a service, you can use you know, whatever, whatever you want to get this application up and running. Configs are quite important to know because this is where you basically define things, where you want to disable stuff. Uh, obviously, your controllers are your business logic, and so on and so forth. Your templates are your views, your, you know, your visual representation, what gets displayed to the user. Um, then you have routing, directives, services. And then there's a thing, obviously I talked about scopes before. There's two kinds of scopes, which is quite important to know with Angular. So there's isolated scopes and global scopes. So within a, a global scope, it's accessible throughout the application, whereas if you're just working with a scope, it's isolated. So when you bind it within a side of controller, only an application which is bound to that controller on the view is, can access it. And obviously, we have expressions. But like I said before, they're not accessible to the DOM. They're sandboxed away, and you can't. You only can do very basic things with it. So as security consultants, you know, why should we care? It's had an extreme you know, huge adoption rate over the past couple of years. And if you look for the trends on what people are Googling, you know, AngularJS is extremely popular. So as you can see from the graph, this is probably like from about 2013. It just kind of skyrockets and carries on. The main problem is um, for developers, and a good thing for us, there's huge breaking changes every time they build a new release. So like they, they basically are saying, hey, we don't really care about you know, backwards compatibility. We're just going to build some new stuff, and we're going to redefine the web. Screw it. So the problem is, if you start looking through the Git repo, you're going to identify very quickly that, yeah, developers probably gonna, aren't going to update their ang Angular, mainly because they don't, it's technical debt. They say to the managers, yeah, this, this, this is vulnerable. Oh, so what? We, we're not refactoring the whole code, and so on and so forth. So then I'm now going to go into some security caveats. So hopefully that kind of gave you a broad overview of what AngularJS looks like, how it works, and how some of the components you know, build together from the MVC kind of style. So we have issues within the framework. And I'm going to go into talking about breaking out the sandbox. As I said before, um, they moved away from the DOM. They don't like it. I'm also going to talk about content security bypasses, bypasses or abusing browsers and the framework itself to you know, create that wonderful cross-site scripting that we all like. I'm also going to briefly talk about sanitizer bypasses. This isn't really um, related, and you won't really see this too much in the wild, but I'll go into that as well. It's just basically a HTML sanitizer. I'm going to look at um, issues introduced by developers. So I'm going to talk about explicitly trusting data, because by default, um, when a developer writes, like for example, you want to display a string, it's not really going to be rendered uh, as HTML. I'm also going to talk about client-side routing and authorization. So as we know, this is a client-side framework. 
Server side, you know, definitely has to be looked into as well, but a lot of people seem to put a lot of trust in the client when it comes to these client side frameworks. And we also have a thing called client side template injection, which I'll go a bit, for, a bit more into later. It's essentially, m when you mix your server and client side templates, it's n you're going to have a bad time. So, there's a long list of things I'm not going to cover in this talk because I'd be here for hours. But there's, there's, there's a few links. So I'm going to distribute the slides afterwards, uh, and they'll be you know, open up on Slide Deck. You can essentially take a look at these security caveats, and they're definitely things that you should look into if you are you know, developing an Angular, and so on and so forth. So we've got issues in the framework. The sandbox. So as I said before, Angular separates from the DOM using expressions. It uses uh, a sanitization function to prevent, you know, malicious code being executed. This means we can't access, you know, the window object, which means we can't call eval. We can't access DOM elements. You can through directives, but that's not really what we want to do as a security expert, or we want to be able to, you know, inject malicious code. You also can't access global variables, and you also can't access the object constructor. And Angular. I'm pretty sure when they first started talking about Angular security, they were saying that the sandbox is for security purposes. But if you now look on the documentation, they're saying the sandbox is not for security reasons. It's to move things away. So I really want to find, and I want to get some you know, alerts popping up. I want to be able to show all my friends how cool I am. So someone called Mario Hedrich found the first sandbox escape. So the way it worked was quite interesting. So inside an expression, you could call a constructor. And when you called that constructor, you could call the constructor of the constructor, which then returns the function constructor, which means you can then access eval. So yo, Doug, I heard you like constructors. This is essentially what it looked like. So you could call the constructor, the constructor of the constructor, and then the function, you know, alert and eval. So obviously, we're now on Angular 1.5 point something, I think. But, so that we have moved on a long way from there. The Angular team fixed it. You can no longer call constructor. So then these guys come along. So Jan Horn, Gareth Hayes, Matthias Carlson, Gabor Mauna have uh, done some research into Angular. And they've essentially, and uh, their Twitter handles are all there. You should check them out, because they always like throw new interesting things into the mix when it comes to cross-site scripting and so on and so forth. Um, so these guys essentially found new ways to um, break out of the sandbox. And I really would like to explain how half this stuff works, but you know, my brain is not as big as theirs. So essentially, you couldn't access constructor anymore, but you could start to slowly you know, access and modify things within inside what was accessible within, a, within an expression, overwrite it here and there, and you, know, you get your alert. So you don't need to understand the full premise of this. You just need to know that there's sandbox escapes for the later versions of Angular. And then it kind of gets a bit weird. So this guy must have been on something strange. Because then he finds <laughs> this kind of pay payload, which allows you to then create your alert. And you know, to be honest, it would take me about a year to figure out how that all actually works. So you know, these researchers have done fantastic work. And you know, I am forever in, the, in their debt. And if I ever go to a security conference, I'm definitely getting them a beer. So they blow my mind, There's, but you should now know there's also a working bypass that what I tested on 1.5.6. It does require user interaction, but essentially, it's a bit strange. It, it makes use of the copy-paste uh, thing with inside Firefox and Opera. Don't think it works in Firefox, inside Chrome. Uh, and then it creates like an SVG animation and so on and so forth. And when they copy that text and then paste it, it then you, know, you can then click the animation and you have your alert. There's a, a wonderful blog um, from the guys at Portswigger, and they go into a lot more detail on how sandbox escapes actually work. So this is kind of just to show you that they're there, and we should definitely be utilizing them when we're doing security assessments. So I'm going to summarize the sandbox, sandbox escapes now. You know, I've always wanted to use a Linkin Park reference in a presentation. So in the end, it does not even matter. Developers cannot rely on updating Angular to be secure from these kind of attacks. They have to make sure that they, you know, users can't modify client-side templates, which is a very difficult chore. 
Um, essentially, attackers have a universal sandbox um, escape. From version one all the way up to the latest version, there's known ways to break out the sandbox. Some of them probably aren't public, which doesn't really require user interaction, but you know, it's safe to say that you know, there's definitely some issues with this sandbox. If you can find a way to do expression interpolation, you're guaranteed XSS in pretty much any version of Angular. Uh, and it's, if you find, if you decide to do some digging with inside Angular, it's very, you know, it's very strange to see if they will actually fix it because they probably won't because Angular 2 is on the way. And let's see what Angular 2 has in store. But at the moment, it's still in development. And I don't know if they've actually even implemented something like a sandbox yet. So now I'm going to move on to uh, content, content security policy. And if you don't know what the content security policy is, it's essentially used in browsers to help protect against XSS. It allows you to essentially define where scripts are loaded and ran. Um, a lot of frameworks don't really work well with CSP, and you have to do a lot of configuration and hacking around. But Angular essentially harmonizes with CSP using its N NGCSP directive. And uh, the whole summary of this really is, you know, abusing browser and framework functionality allows cross-site scripting even when you have strict CSP. So the overall, the, um, the early bypasses were quite trivial. On-click isn't accessible, obviously, because we're away from the DOM, but you can abuse the framework. So what we had was an ng-click directive. You can call event, which leaks window, and then you have your alert. So then you can then process and evaluate it, and then you have your cross-site scripting. Then they fix that, so that's a shame. Then they have um, issues within the browser. I'm not really going to go into too much detail about this, but there's a really good um, presentation by, uh, I forgot his name. <laughs> it'll, it'll come back to me. Uh, he's essentially, um, it abuses the uh, ES6 reflect API in Chrome, and essentially you use like a blob object to um, and, it and, it and it reflects back without the CSP headers, so you have your cross-site scripting. But then, again, a Lincoln Park reference, it doesn't even matter because we have a universal CSP bypass within Angular. So, does anyone whitelist CDNs in their CSP if they use CSP at all? Anyone? Anyone at all? Yeah? Do you uh, whitelist the Ajax Google APIs? Yes or no? No. Okay. Well, you shouldn't, because <laughs> here's why. So think, I'm going to try and explain it in a way where it makes sense. So think that we're including a content security policy in PHP. You know, we're allowing um, scripts to be loaded from Google APIs. And then on the page, there's this, um, you know, get query, get the parameter XSS. So, and then, for example, we have the page, the example like this, you know, http://example.com foo XSS, and then add some evil code. To take a look at this, this is essentially a universal CSP bypass. So you can use your, you can, even if an application isn't using Angular, you can essentially, hey, I'm going to bind whatever I'm you know, attaching to, use it with the ng app to bootstrap Angular. You can then call ng CSP and then use the ng click directive and then call back the old school one that's now fixed in newer versions. And then just include the, the earlier version of Angular that was vulnerable. And this overall basically gives you um, a universal you know, CSP bypass regardless of, as long as they're whitelisting that you know, specific domain. So there's actually quite a nice challenge, and I've turned my internet off because I don't trust any of you guys. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a nice example on CSP bypasses um, uh, by the HTML5 team. And uh, it's the example there, I'll give out the slides and you guys can check it out. It doesn't work in Chrome. They've actually blocked it, it seems. But it works in Firefox. Now there's um, sanitizer bypasses. Sanitizers, you know, the sanitizer is essentially an XSS filter. Uh, inside Angular, there's a co component called you know, dollar sanitize, and it basically it'll take a string and it will, and this is actually used in expressions, I think, as well, where it essentially returns a clean string ready to use within the view. The old sanitizer, when, they st when uh, the guys started to look at it in 2015, um, they found out they're actually using a HTML parser from 2008. The problem is, this could be bypassed by including an SVG image using the use element, which allows you to pull resources from a domain, which means if you could find a way to store XSS on a page or just to you know, alert one and so on and so forth, you could then pull that image in and you have it. Then they realized that was a problem, so they fixed it. 
And now they use the, um, you basically, the new sanitizer uses the DOM. And they use document implementation, which basically means we're going to make a new, fresh document. It's not going to be vulnerable to attacks, and they can move on. But then Chrome comes into the mix where Chrome isn't fixing their wonderful Unicode issues. So I don't know if I, I don't no, I don't have an example of that today. But essentially, the way it works is you can include a Unicode that's essentially a white space. And with, if you ever touch this with inner HTML, it strips away the white space, and then you can create a full JavaScript URI. And then that will essentially allow you to then do cross-site scripting. Now I'm going to go into the more fun stuff from what you'll probably highly likely find when you're testing applications. Everything that's going to be shown today, I have found on client sites, and they probably still haven't fixed them, to be honest. So um, we're going to talk about explicitly trusting data. So this means you know um, you're taking user input and you're you know explicitly trusting it. So there's something called as uh, strict contextual escaping with inside Angular. And essentially, if you give it um, a malicious tag for a central image source equals something, and then on mouse over or on error, it essentially would strip out the on error, and it would just keep the rest as a clean you know, HTML. So SCE was introduced into Angular from 1.2. 1 well, 1 so anything before that, you'd have to manually add, include the um, dependency uh, module with inside your you know, module itself. And then you would need to turn it on. So you would have to enable SCE through the SCE provider and enable it. So whenever you're looking at applications that are earlier than 1.2, um, you can start looking for these attributes to see if they've been attached. If not, they're not really using the feature, and they could be vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So, and it also can be disabled altogether by using the same thing, but just turning it to false. Don't do this, because anything um, specified with an ng-bind ng HTML directive will cause cross-site scripting if it allows, you know, if it's taken from user input. So yeah, you can set it to false, and then it turns off. Then you need to, once you are using a version which has it, you know, included, um, you essentially can set things to the ng-bind HTML, and the ng-bind HTML essentially um, evaluates an expression and inserts the, result, um, the resulting HTML into an element in a secure way, unless you um, basically directly say, no, I'm going to um, explicitly trust this data. So you have um, some functions within SCE called trust as, and then you essentially can define a type. The only thing that works, works with ng-bind HTML is um, trust as HTML, but the developers in Angular have released stuff like trust as JavaScript, trust as CSS, and so on and so forth, and these can be deployed in people's, people who make custom directives. You also have you know, the SCE trust as direct and just give it a value, and this would trust it. And now I'm going to try and, and just show this in a demo. So for example, think of this as um, we have an app, we have a controller, and we're in ng binding HTML hello. Then we have our controller, and essentially, uh, oh wow, I changed this very briefly before I came, in, came on and displayed this. But So essentially, this is supposed to reflect what's in the controller, and we're calling SCE trust as HTML, and essentially this is malicious because it has an on mouse over event, and it will do the JavaScript function. So now, pray to the demo gods that this is going to work. So, oh, we can't see it. Okay. Can I move this over here? Cool. Well, now I'm going to have to do this like this. So, I have essentially an application I have built within Digital. And it's got some AngularJS related vulnerabilities. So we have a bookmarks application. It's better than Pinboard, obviously. Um, so if we go to bookmarks and essentially inspect this element, which is very difficult to do. I can't even see it. There we go. So if we inspect this element, and it's over here. <laughs> One second. Uh, the demo gods are not proud today. So as you can see, it's probably quite difficult to see because I can't hardly see it, but we have ng-bind HTML, 
and the bookmark name. Now, if we do the same for this year, the URL itself, as you can see, we're doing ng by HTML, but we're explicitly trusting the data. So anything that gets you know, entered in there is going to you know, create an alert. And I can't see anything now. No, oh, what's going on? That's not good. Let's just close this down and see if that gets rid of it. There you go. So let's just say script alert one in the first one. And I don't know. And we'll call this one script alert two. So if we submit that, because it's explicitly trusted, we now have our cross-site scripting. But as you can see, only two displayed, only because we're explicitly trusting the data. I've seen this on about probably four or five client sites where they've been explicitly trusting data from either like a, because everyone now likes to work in bleeding edge frameworks, so everyone's using the mean stack. Um, and they're storing stuff in a Mongo collection and they're echoing it out in a, you know, a trusted manner. So I'm going to delete that and then carry on back into the thing. But that shows you that explicitly, explicitly trusting data is bad and you should not do it unless you're confident that the source isn't going to be changed. So that's, this is a screenshot just showing that it worked, just in case the demo fell over. And then there's also something um, within a scope object called eval. So you can't do generic you know, evaluations with JavaScript eval because we're not accessing it. This allows you to do a bit more complex Java-related stuff, but you still can't um, directly access things like, you know, um, just do an alert. So the eval function evaluates Angular expressions. So a, an actual secure version of way of doing it is to essentially, um, this, is, this translates to scope eval, I want to evaluate scope A and scope B. And you can also evaluate functions. So function name and so on and so forth. So if what I've, what I've found from testing Angular, you know, if the data is not wrapped within single quotations, this can cause security issues. So if we look the same thing, but explicitly you know, calling the data without wraps in single quotations, um, this is vulnerable to cross-site scripting, and it also allows you to access things within the scope and the root scope. So an example of this, this is the secure way of doing it. As you can, we don't really need to go into too much about this because we've already talked about it today. But essentially, we have a function here that's calling scope eval, and it's setting it to message. So anything within A, it's going to get evaluated. The insecure way of doing it would be you know, to include the scope A, and this would actually allow you to, one, use, if they're using an earlier version of Angular that you know a sandbox escape to, you could use that, and it would evaluate it, and you would get your alert. Or you could directly call functions on the client, and that's you know, not great because, for example, that these functions might go away and call the server, and you might be able to do additional elevated privileges attacks from this. Now I'm going to move on to client-side routing and authorization. So this is quite a, bit, a lot of things to take in, but essentially there's, there's been a few online blogs on how, hey, here's how to like kickstart your application using client-side routing. And I've unfortunately had the pleasure of testing some of these applications. They're not very good. Um, so permission models on the client, and as you can see, there's something called this. So as, as we saw before, we have um, essentially, we're including ng route and we're, we're basically dependency injecting the route provider. Then we're calling the route provider, and then when someone browses this resource, you're loading, the page, loading a, a, a partial page. Um, I'm not entirely sure what that does. Then you're calling the controller on what's going to be doing, and then this resolve is essentially, I want to validate that someone is authorized or is an administrator. You know, and this is all on the client. You know, we can do some very malicious things with this, which means we can mi modify them on the client, and then if they're not validating on the server, we can gain access. And that's generally you know, what most app web applications do, but unfortunately, because of this you know, move to the, everything into the client, it's becoming more and more common to see these kind of attacks. So you know, uh, the long story short of it is you wouldn't, shouldn't really you know, trust the client. You know, it really should be only considered like, um, a, an experience for the user and you know, optimizing the business logic. So for example, Applications, in, especially with JavaScript, generally tend to store like uh, the first name, the last name, the role, and so on and so forth within like session storage or local storage. 
And then that's because they, when they refresh the page, they're, they're going to have a persistent you know, model and they can actually, you know, the users don't have to keep logging in, so on and so forth. So you know, any authentication authorization on the client can be bypassed. You know, it's on the client, so you have access to it. And you know, any authorization authentication has to be enforced on the server. So never trust the client. So this one, um, I'm going to give another demo. And I'm going to have to log out of this user because he is an admin. And this is going to be very difficult to do. So I've made a SteelCon user called SteelCon at SteelCon.info. And the password is very secure. No, it's not the right password because it's SteelCon. There we go. So at the moment, I'm a normal user. I don't have admin privileges. But on this page, and I would view the source, but I know it will go horribly wrong, so I'll just kind of give you a summary. On this page, it's checking to see if the person's an admin, and it will give them an additional you know, thing in this drop-down. The problem is they're using session storage along with client-side routing with no server-side protection, which means if you modify it on a client, you're going to essentially elevate your privilege and see resources that you shouldn't have been able to see. So as I said, they're using session storage. So if we go into resources, and I can't see that session storage. Can I open that? What? There it is. That's not right. I can't. I'll do it. I'll change it over here and then show you. That was in cookies. That's the reason why I couldn't do it. OK. So just to briefly show you, uh, the session storage looks like this. We have the username, steelcon, we have the roles, which is currently blank, the first name and the last name. So if I change the role to obviously reflect an admin, which I'm going to do now. So this is now saved, and if I, at the moment, it still shouldn't reflect because it hasn't been updated within the object model, but applications generally do store things in session storage like this. If you refresh, now I should have access to the admin portal. And you know I've gained full control, and the problem is I shouldn't be able to delete users because there's actually security protections on that. The user didn't disappear. So that's kind of giving you a summary. Do not you know trust the client. You know it's one of those things that we already all know, but it's definitely a, a more common occurrence you're going to see with an Angular application. Hmm. Okay, this is wrong. It's meant to say. <laughs> client site template injection. So we have different kinds of templates. Uh, so we have the server side templates that generally are um, Jade or EJS or Pug. Um, there's also JP, uh, G JSP for Java and Smarty. In the example I'm using today is Jade, uh, but the demo or the, the actual explanation is in EJS. And then you also have your client side templates, which are AngularJS and React. So, you know, mixing these, these templates on the ser server side and, and you know, the client side, um, you can basically cause cross-set scripting without having to even write a script. So, user input is added to the server side template and is sent to the client side template. You know, the, the server uh, will in, uh, escape or encode malicious tag, you know, flags such as uh, less than, greater than, and so on and so forth. But within an Angular expression, it's not really classed as malicious. So it won't be escaped on the server. And it will eventually be executed when it gets sent back to the client to be processed. And it will run you know, within the sandbox, and it won't, and then, but avoid mixing them. So this is ni a nice little um, um, diagram. The colors are a bit broken because of the, the screen. But when you're talking about template inje injection, uh, a malicious AngularJS code is injected, so if you're allowing user input to be sent to the server, then the template engine uh, will only escape HTML special characters, and then it's essentially sent to the client side, where it will render the AngularJS expression, and the malicious code will be executed. So to summarize this in code, we have um, a, a, a parameter called name, which is uh, wrapped inside interpolation um, characters. On the server, we're rendering uh, the EJS template, and we're also allowing, the, uh, we're taking in the name parameter. So an example of this, uh, presuming a controller has a logout function, 
we can call this, um, you know, this name equals to curly braces and call the function. And then it would essentially look like this, and you would call the logout function. So this is another demo that I'm going to show. And uh, this is a more common thing that you will see in the wild, mainly because, you know, for example, if you go to Portswigger and look at their releases of blogs, they've actually found some issues like this uh, in the wild recently. So we have a name function here that's a search that basically searches for bookmarks from you know, the name. And you know, if I search for Lewis, it's going to return Lewis. If I search for Steelcon, it's going to return Steelcon. But the problem is, if uh, I can add um, you know, angle brackets, and the server takes it and processes it and then sends it back to the server, this should evaluate to free, which it does. Now that's you know, interesting, but it's not really um, a, a security flaw in itself. So what I'm going to do is, uh, this application is using Angular version 1.4.4, and it has a known sandbox break, uh, breakout string that we can do. So it kind of looks like this. I'll show you here first. It's kind of the same thing that we did, or we showed you for 1.0. So within here, we can send it. It will get processed by the server, and then it comes back to the client, and there you go. You have your alert. Now, that's not just the thing that you can do. You can, oh, this actually really breaks up the application one, because you can never get out of it. No, no, OK. Right, this is what I had to do last time. Slowly but surely, I get there. OK. <laughs> so yeah, it's not the only thing you can do. Because um, within this application, um, the user object is essentially setting the global scope. There's no controller attached to this um, part of the application. But because in the global scope, it's accessible throughout all of Angular. So if I just request the user object of, of who I'm currently logged in as, it's going to process it. It's going to return it back wherever this you know, client-side template to server-side template injection exists. And then you know, something a bit more malicious is where you can call the user object and you know, set it to undefined, if I wrote that correctly. And then it logs the user out. It's not really a problem in itself because it's using session storage, so I can just refresh the page. And it will actually log me out because the string's still there. But <laughs> if you go to another page and then refresh, and now log back in. That's not a huge problem in itself, but it def well, it is. You know, mixing server-side and client-side templates is a huge problem, and it's bound to happen quite a lot, especially when people are moving legacy code over and they're rendering things on the server. So now I'm going to talk about essentially where you would look with inside Angular, and you know, hopefully some helpful tips that might help you identify some of these issues. So, of course, the first thing to do would be to verify the Angular version. Depending how you're approaching an application, is it code-based? Is it, you know, you're testing it from a black box perspective? You know, you might be given source codes, which means you could probably look at the dependencies that have been included into the application. Or you can look for the literal string. Or you can essentially, um, you know, actually, if they've basically tried to strip out some of the, you know, telling you what it is, or if it's a minified version, Start looking for the error, error responses that get sent to the server. Well, uh, basically, when, when an error happens, it comes back up with relevant information for Angular, and it will keep it to the version that's essentially set. So that will be quite helpful to find. I haven't really gone into this today, but check third-party libraries. There are two that were on the slides that I've added some links to. They had DOM-based cross-site scripting, and you could utilize them once people use them in their application. So you want to check what's currently injected into the module itself. So if you see, for example, ng sanitize, you know it's highly likely that they're going to start using SCE within their application, which means they might then start explicitly trusting data. And the same for you can start look at the routing and start to get a bit more understanding. You can also look to see are they using, um, are they checking for authorization headers and so on and so forth. So yeah, you can also um, look what uh, look what is dependency injected into controllers. That's very helpful as well because you know, then you know exactly on that page they might be trusting data or they might be calling a service that might have a known vulnerability when you start looking at the client side codes. You want to look at custom directives and services, mainly because it's, they've been developed by the actual developers themselves. But as you've also seen, uh, earlier versions of Angular could be abused by you know, attacking directives directly. And you also I obviously didn't go into too much detail about this today, but you'll want to take a look at what they're storing within local storage, because that's persistent, and um, 
it's, even if you close the page and come back a week later, it's still probably going to be there unless you, know, you delete it manually or if the application has forced you to delete it. And you are going to have to spend a lot of time in the controller and understanding the client-side logic and how everything works. Um, you are going to have to you know, see if you can bypass certain permissions, make sure they're being validated on the server, and everything like that. So this is coming towards the end, and I'm going to go into some tools that probably will help you out. They definitely help me out. So we have RetireJS. We have Burp Suite, of course. We have a call tool called Batarang and an Angular version 2.0, which probably isn't going to be used that much yet. We have ScanJS and ESLint. ScanJS is deprecated, but it, you know, it's good. And then, obviously, uh, talking for our own company, we have a tool called Jax that's soon going to be coming out. So RetireJS, it essentially scans, uh, depending on what you use, you, have a, you can have a command line scanner that will actually like, scan a repo or a code base to look for known JavaScript vulnerabilities in the, in the libraries that are used. Generally, I use the um, Burp Suite plugin because I always live in Burp Suite, and it will basically um, use the active scanner or passive scanner and directly report to you straight away if there's an issue. So if you take a look at this, it's supposed to be red, but it's not. Um, essentially, this um, you know, RetireJS directly tells you, hey, this version is vulnerable. Here's more information about it, and then you can go away and see if you can exploit it or find any issues which relate to that version. And there's also Burp Suite. So as I said before, um, Ports Figure have released some really cool blogs related to Angular recently. And they've actually started to introduce some of these client-side and server-side template injections directly into the active scanning techniques. So as you can see, I scanned this against the application I showed today. And you know, it reported saying, hey, um, you know, by using this string, I've been able to get a response. And then there's also um, a tool called Batarang. So, when you just right-click and view the source, you're, all you're going to see are expressions. You're not going to see how things have been dynamically generated at runtime. And I'm going to show you a bit of how this works. So it's a, a Chrome extension, which is going to be quite difficult to see. But essentially, um, once you, you know, install it, it will, tell, it will give you the scope objects with inside an application. And generally, the root scope objects, for example, the user object is going to be at the beginning. And as you can see, I can then log in, and then I can look at the roles, and you know, I could change this to, to member, to admin, and so on and so forth. You could obviously do some by capturing the response and changing the response from, like, connect, for example, testing in Burp Suite. But this just allows you to get the, a good look and feel of how things work. And like, for example, when I'm iterating through an array or something like that, um, it should show you the bookmark objects that are available as well. And it obviously has the corresponding information about that. Oh, lost my screen. OK, so that's Batarang. And then we have ScanJS. It's a bit deprecated, it's a bit old, but it's still good. So you know that there's some strings that are definitely not what you should be doing within Angular. You can essentially build a list or, um, of, of known things. You can then obviously scan your repos or JavaScript files to see if any of them exist, and that saves you a lot of time and having to do the manual process directly. And then, this is obviously a, a company plug, but um, we're releasing, we've, we have a tool called Jax from our sister company called Codescope. At the moment, it's, a, it's, a, it's built in JavaScript, it's a JavaScript static code analysis tool. It's very, very fast. Um, and at the moment, we look into Node, Express, MongoDB, Spring, and Happy. But in the near future, um, which I you know, have the privilege of working in and working with the team, we're going to be releasing AngularJS um, static code analysis scanning. So I'm going to summarize this presentation. AngularJS is an interesting model view whatever, as the, the team like to say. There are and were some interesting issues within the framework. Be careful of SCE, because if you explicitly trust data, you're going to have a bad time. Use the eval wisely. Make sure it's enclosed in single quotations and only accessing objects through that way. Never trust the client, and do not mix client and server templates. There's a, some additional reading, and I'll, I'll, sti I'll stick it on slide, slide share and tweet about it. You guys can you know, go away and take a look at that in the future. This one is extremely great, and they also have a, uh, if you go onto YouTube and type in, 
an abusive relationship with Angular JS, you'll find one of his talks as well, and it's really good. And the Port Swigger ones are extremely good as well. So that's my presentation. Thanks a lot. And do you have any questions? Any questions? That's good. I'm going to the pub. See you later. <laughs> Sorry? Um, I actually haven't started to look into it too much. I mean, I started to look to see if they were using SCE. Um, not, not sure. <laughs> they're, they're, they've started to build the APIs, but there's no documentation referencing yet, and I haven't really begun to dig into the code base. But it, it's going to be interesting then, then basically, uh, when people want to upgrade to two, they're going to have to rewrite their entire application because the whole concept has changed. Everything's a service instead of things like services, factories, directives. Everything is pretty much classed as a service, from what I've been able to see. Oh, do you? Yeah. Oh. It still sounds like a pain to me, but <laughs> no, that's good. That's good to know. Any other questions? Oh, thank you. Cheers.